Well, greetings, everyone. This is Amal Matu from University of Maryland, and this week we're going to spend a little time talking trauma with Dr. Kenji Inaba. Actually, we're going to spend some time listening to Kenji. He is faculty member at USC LA County Hospital, one of the busiest trauma centers in the country, and he's also one of the busiest lecturers on the CME circuit, goes all around the country speaking on trauma topics. Last year at Resuscitation, Kenji gave a really, really outstanding lecture on updates in ATLS based on the new 8th edition of the ATLS textbook. He talked about 10 different things, and for this segment, we're just going to spend a little time talking about a few of those topics that I thought were particularly helpful. Actually, all of them were helpful. You can listen to the whole lecture on See Me Download, but I'm just going to pick out a few things. And before we get started with that, actually, Kenji talked a little bit about where ATLS first originated, and I thought it was interesting. So we're going to listen to Kenji talk about how ATLS was first created. A lot of people may not realize it, but ATLS was created originally by an orthopedic surgeon. Yes, believe it or not, he's still actually practicing. So Kenji, go ahead and take it away. I'm going to try to give you a brief description of uh, ATLS and the real key changes from the 7th edition, now that we're on the 8th. This is how uh, ATLS all started. It was February 17, 1976, at about 6 p.m. in rural Nebraska. And this was the plane crash that started it all. Uh, this is Jim Steiner. He's an orthopedic surgeon and a pilot. And he was one that crashed that plane into that field in Nebraska with his wife and four children. And uh, I don't know if you've ever written anything or read anything that he's written, but uh, it's really interesting to uh, read his account of what happened that night after he crashed the plane. And uh, in, in parts of the excerpts uh, of uh, what he's written, he went on to say that he went looking for his wife three different times and found her on the third try, checked her, confirmed that she was gone, and I went back to check her three more times to be sure she was gone. He then flagged a car down at 2 a.m., said goodbye to his wife, and he drove to a local community hospital a few miles south. And he found that when he got to that hospital, it was locked. So he knocked, and the night nurse opened that door and was quite startled to see these injured uh, patients. And so when he went on to explain the predicament that he was in and asked her if he could get his kids inside, she actually said no and informed him that he'd have to wait outside until the doctors arrived. And it wasn't until the doctors arrived that care began to happen, and even then it was a very difficult time. You know, one of the things that he says is finally, as one of his doctors picked up one of his sons, Rick, to start looking after him, he picked him up by the shoulders and the knees and took him into the x-ray room. And he says, try to picture the motion of his head and neck with this maneuver. And it wasn't until 8 a.m. the next morning, about 14 hours after the crash, that they were transferred to Lincoln General Hospital, and he could finally become a patient and let someone else do the work. And as he described the longest night of his life, he went on to say that when I can provide better care in the field than what my children and I received at the primary care facility, there's something wrong with the system, and that system has to be changed. Now, he said that in 1977, and about a year later, the first ATLS course was run. And this ATLS course was designed to provide one safe way of providing the initial assessment and care of injured patients that could be standardized across multiple different locations. In 1980, it was adopted by the American College of Surgeons. It was put into Canada the following year, expanded outside of North America in 1986, and now has been taught in more than 50 different countries around the world with more than a million students to date. Okay, let's go ahead and have Kenji start talking about some of the updates based on the 8th edition of ATLS. The first one that I thought was interesting has to do with this. No, we're not talking about finger injuries. Picture that there's a glove with lubricant on my finger, so you know what I'm talking about. The digital rectal exam. Do we really need to do the digital rectal exam on patients that have major trauma? It's certainly a bit of a pet peeve for many of us in the emergency department. And I remember back when I was an intern working on the trauma service, my sole and most important responsibility was doing the rectal exam. What a great job, right? And I used to wonder whether there's any utility to doing that. As the low man on the totem pole, what am I doing? And what do we routinely do? or accomplished by doing the digital rectal exam. Well, the 8th edition has addressed this, so Kenji, tell us a little bit about the rectal exam. In the 7th edition, every patient got a rectal examination, but in the 8th edition, they suggested that a rectal exam should be performed selectively, and it was based on Tom Esposito's study, 
It was a prospective study of 512 patients. And what they did was they took digital rectal examination and they compared it to other clinical indicators for three specific injuries where we would like to think that the rectal exam could be helpful, and that would be cord injury, GI bleeding for hollow viscous injury, and urethral disruption. And what they found was that there was about a 5.7% index injury rate, and both the digital rectal exam and the clinical indicators had a 99% negative predictive value, but in all cases where the clinical indicators missed an injury, so did the rectal. And what they suggested was emitting the rectal, therefore, in virtually all trauma patients appears permissible safe and, in fact, for the patient, advantageous. All right, that's great news. Uh, what about this? Have you ever had a patient that had uh, chest trauma and their chest x-ray looked pretty good, no signs of a pneumothorax, but then for whatever reason, uh, you get a CAT scan of the chest and you see a small pneumothorax. So oftentimes it's referred to as a, an occult pneumothorax. In other words, chest x-ray is normal. You pick it up on a CAT scan. What if you're going to intubate that patient? Does that patient automatically need to get a chest tube? I learned that if you're going to intubate a patient, no matter how small the pneumothorax is, you probably ought to put a chest tube in because the positive pressure ventilation is going to turn that small pneumo into a tension pneumothorax, and then you're going to have PEA and cardiac arrest, and the patient's going to die, and you're going to get sued, and you're never going to work in emergency medicine ever, ever again, and you're probably going to end up a hospital administrator which may not be so bad because you'd probably make a ton more money. But anyway, what, what are we supposed to do with these occult pneumothoraces? Kenji, what do we do? Okay, number six. Now, if you get a chest x-ray like this where an exuberant radiology resident has gone and marked off every conceivable finding on the chest x-ray, you're good to go. And there is, uh, as outlined by the four or five arrows in pneumothorax there. But what about the patient that comes in with a chest x-ray like this? but on their CT scan has a little pocket of air, so the occult pneumothorax. Now, in the seventh edition, they suggested that either observation or aspiration of this pneumothorax would be risky, but in the eighth edition, they suggested that although they may be best treated with a chest tube, observation of an asymptomatic occult pneumothorax may, in fact, be appropriate. And this was based on Karen Brazel's study. It was a prospective randomized study that they cited in ATLS 44 blunt trauma patients, very small. They were randomized to observation versus insertion of a chest tube, and the outcome measures were respiratory distress and the need for chest tube placement or some other emergent intervention. There was about a 5.9% occult pneumothorax rate. About 50% of these patients were on positive pressure ventilation, which was classically a contraindication to observation. And they found that for these patients, there's an 8.3% progression rate in the observation group requiring a chest tube insertion which was the same as the control group. And really, the respiratory distress rates were the same, and there was no need for an emergent chest tube placement. So um, by ATLS and in general clinical practice, unless they're going to undergo transportation or in, are in some sort of unmonitored setting where the ability to put a chest tube in will be compromised, these can be safely observed as long as the patients are truly being observed. All right, well, let's do one more. One of the other updates that Kenji talked about was the issue of steroids in spinal cord injury. Now, this is something that's been another problem for a lot of people for many years. There was early studies that were not very good that indicated that steroids are beneficial in spinal cord injury. And the result was that the entire uh, mainstream group of trauma folks uh, around the world started using high-dose methylprednisolone anytime there is a spinal cord injury. And yet when people started looking at that data, they found that it really wasn't very good data, but everyone was afraid of being sued if they didn't give the steroids or, or not practicing the standard of care. And so ATLS has finally addressed this issue. So Kenji, tell us about steroids for spinal cord trauma. Seventh edition, in North America... High-dose methylprednisolone is a currently accepted treatment. In the 8th edition, they went on to say that there is insufficient evidence to support the routine use of steroids in spinal cord injury at present. And again, he uh, briefly discussed NASIS-2 and the NASIS-3 trials. And again, NASIS-2 was methylprednisolone versus naloxone versus placebo. And all the primary outcome measures were negative in this study. And really, everything that they concluded was based on a post hoc analysis of about 38% of the initial patient load with a very arbitrary eight hour cutoff. And again, for NASA's three, same sort of setup. They looked at 24 hours, 
versus 48 hours versus another drug, all of whom got a methylprednisolone bolus. And again, I think the most important thing to remember is that all the primary outcome measures were negative. All the conclusions were drawn off of post hoc data. And this post hoc treatment effect really had many significant statistical errors. And really, the clinical relevance of what they actually found in the post hoc analysis is very questionable. None of these positive results have been independently reproduced at all. And there were higher complications seen in patients that got steroids. So based on that, um, ATLS has really dropped it as a routine recommendation. Okay, so just to recap these three points. Number one, digital rectal exam, not routinely necessary. Number two, a chest tube for the occult pneumothorax, not routinely necessary, because unless you're probably going to be transporting that patient, then it might be the safe thing, but not routinely necessary. And number three, steroids for spinal cord trauma, not routinely necessary, not a recommendation. So, you know, ATLS 8th uh, edition has come away from routinely recommending one or two interventions for everything, which is a good thing. ATLS was originally created in many ways as a one-size-fits-all approach to trauma, and we really don't need to do that anymore. As more and more trauma experts and emergency physicians, people that are trained in resuscitation are getting out there, I think it's very reasonable for those people that have experience in resuscitation to not use a one-size-fits-all game plan, but rather to use this thing called clinical judgment. And it seems that ATLS, as it advances, is moving more and more in the direction of clinical judgment. Go figure. Good thing. It's a good thing to use clinical judgment. So uh, thanks to Kinji Inaba. And also uh, listen out for more of his lectures on trauma at Resuscitation 2012. We'll be sure to have him back on the Resuscitation video cast. That's it for me, and we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Thanks.